By 1912, Harold believes that his ARC phone is good enough for broadcasting to an audience. The ARC phone activity that Harold says proves his claim to being the father of radio broadcasting is the Wednesday night Little Hams program. Harold tells his students that the Wednesday night programs are broadcasting for the people of San Jose. He also tells them that everyone else transmitting voice at the time is only narrowcasting. He is on every week at the same time, and he knows that he is entertaining a public audience. And as an early form of advertising, the broadcasts help attract students to his college. This is the improved ARC phone that Charles Harold used for his Wednesday night broadcasts. It survives because he gave it to museum owner Doug Parham back in the 1940s. Imagine that it's 1912 and you're a disc jockey and this is both your studio and your transmitter. When you wanted to make an announcement, you spoke into this microphone, but you had to be careful. You couldn't get too close or, or touch it because the microphone was in series with the high voltage used to generate the arc. And because the high voltage made the microphone heat up, it was water cooled. Circulating water actually ran through this microphone at all times. Now, if you wanted to play a record, you cranked up the phonograph. You can see how this modified bell is aimed in the general direction of the microphone. Pick up the sound. The major audience for these broadcasts were the young kids who built their own wireless sets, the young experimenters. They had to build their own radios. They loved it. I can't believe you're still fooling with this junk. We've been up here three days. You haven't even been out on the pond yet. I've almost got it this time. You know where you can find me when you come to your senses. Wait a minute. Put these on. I only got two hands, I gotta untangle my line. So put the receivers on your head. You don't know what you're missing. There's a couple cute girls on the other side of the lake. I told them about you. Well, I didn't tell them everything about you. I didn't tell them you were crazy. But I did tell them. Jeez! You heard something, didn't you? What the hell is that? That's Doc Harold's music. I did it! Are you trying to tell me that music is coming from that wireless college in town? That's exactly what I'm saying. Listen. That's a John Philip Sousa march. What were you saying about me being crazy? Shh. I want to hear this. Plans were made ahead of time for the content of each show. Records were picked out, newspaper stories to read were decided on, even contests were planned, with the winner getting a small prize like this little piece of galena used to make a crystal receiving set. It was called the Little Hams Program because most of the listeners were young experimenters. But Harold also set up radios in public places, and he and his students built receiving sets for friends and family. These Wednesday night broadcasts continued every week between 1912 and 1917. News of the broadcast began to spread. The audience grew larger. We get some idea of what the public thought about broadcasting from a 1915 editorial in the San Jose newspaper. Instead of recognizing this as a momentous achievement, as a revolution in communications, the San Jose newspaper editor deplored the fact that this could threaten a lifelike entertainment, that it might, that it was sort of a, an ersatz substitute for the real symphony orchestra. Every Wednesday night at nine o'clock, he would be on because he knew he had 50 or more listeners with crystal detectors to report to him. They'd call up on the phone, ask for records, and what have you. The listeners were all amateurs that had crystal detectors list listening to ships or code or whatever they could learn and read and find, and uh, they were startled to find music coming in on their ears <laughs> from this Carroll station. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, they'd call us right up and say, put on such and such a record or uh, play over and over. Certain ones that they liked better. We even had listeners within, uh, I'd say at that time, and even in the earliest ARC days, it was heard as far away as 900 miles, but under very favorable conditions. One reason that the Wednesday night broadcasts attract so much attention is because of Harold's young wife, Sybil. She became a, a, a disc jockey, if you will. They didn't use that term in those days. And I guess she liked it for a while. Uh, she, uh, because I remember I interviewed her years later and uh, she was very, very pleased because she got a lot of response from the community. People called up or wrote her fan letters or talked to her on the street that they heard the programs. And I really believe that I was the first woman to ever broadcast a program. We used to get uh, cards from the little hams uh, asking us to play after we started playing the records for their little programs on Wednesday night. My grandmother always told me that she was the first, at least the first female disc jockey, she thought in the world at least. She used to tell us how she used to go down and get the records from the record store and she would come, come and play them over the radio. And I went to Sherman and Clay and arranged to uh, borrow records. She would take them back and play them over the radio. And uh, Sherman Clay loved it because the next day they'd sell out of whatever it was she'd played over the radio. After they got the voice and that perfected and the music broadcasting perfected, why then it was, he was anxious to get it into the homes and so that everyone could enjoy it. <laughs> 